This talk will cover three major principles of the management of atrial fibrillation that includes stroke prevention, rate control, and rhythm control. It is well established that patients with atrial fibrillation are at elevated risk of stroke and that anticoagulation can reduce that risk. The decision to start anticoagulation involves balancing the benefits of clot prevention with the risk of bleeding. When indicated, anticoagulation can and should be started by primary care providers, hospitalists, or other general medicine providers without needing specialist consultation. Minimizing delays in treatment can aid in stroke prevention. In stable patients with atrial fibrillation, there are four primary goals. Prevent stroke, control heart rate, reduce or eliminate symptoms, and modify underlying risk factors. What is the name of the stroke risk assessment tool used to make decisions on when to initiate anticoagulation? The stroke risk assessment score is called a chads vasc score. The C part of the chads vasc 2 score is CHF. These include patients with history of symptomatic heart failure or even asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction on cardiac imaging. H is for hypertension, any history of hypertension regardless if it's controlled or poorly controlled. A is for age, patient receives a plus 1 if their age is between 65 and 74, and patients over the age of 75 receives a plus 2. D is for diabetes, S is for stroke, TIA, or systemic embolism. These are patients with history of stroke, transient ischemic attack, or systemic thromboembolism. Please note that systemic embolism includes arterial embolism, and therefore DVT and PE are not included in this patient population. V is for vascular disease. This includes any history of coronary artery disease, such as prior myocardial infarction, a disease noted on angiography or other imaging, or patients with angina, or peripheral vascular disease, and this includes symptomatic claudication and history of peripheral intervention. S is for sex. Female sex is a risk modifier in that for each non-sex risk factor, females tend to have a higher stroke risk than males. What is the bleeding risk assessment tool commonly used to assess the risk of major bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation? The bleeding risk assessment tool is called HASBLED. H is for hypertension, which is poorly controlled with a systolic blood pressure of at least 160. A refers to abnormal renal or liver function. S refers to stroke any history of ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. B refers to bleeding history or predisposition to bleeding. L refers to labile INR for patients on warfarin. E refers to elderly on those patients over the age of 65. D refers to drugs. So these are concomitant use of medications such as NSAIDs or antiplatelets as well as excessive alcohol use. A high HAS blood score of at least a 3 is indicative of the need for regular clinical review and follow-up, but should not be used per se as a reason for stopping oral anticoagulation. A high HAS blood score allows us clinicians to identify patients at potential risk for serious bleeding in an informed manner rather than relying on guesswork. The latter may be dangerous, as it has been shown that clinicians are poor in estimating bleeding risk. The decision to prescribe anticoagulation is based on patient's CHAS-VAS2 score. Current guidelines recommend anticoagulation for a score of 2 or greater in male or 3 or greater in females. Guidelines recommend against anticoagulation for CHAS-VAS2 score of 0 in males or 1 in females. In between, 1 in males or 2 in females is less clear and guidelines offer that anticoagulation may be considered, and this should prompt a risk-benefit discussion with the patient.
Direct oral anticoagulants, also known as DOACs, have been shown to be more effective and have lower bleeding risk than warfarin, and current guidelines recommend DOAC as the first line for most patients. There is emerging evidence comparing one DOAC to another, but for now, guidelines do not recommend one over the other. Current guidelines recommend DOAC as the first line for most patients except for valvular atrial fibrillation. Valvular atrial fibrillation refers only to moderate or severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical valve. Any other valvular lesions, such as aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation, still falls under non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Patients with moderate to severe mitral stenosis were excluded from trials evaluating efficacy of DOAX, and current guidelines recommend warfarin for these patients though there may be more data in the future. Patients with mechanical valves require warfarin. DOACs have been studied in this population and were found to be inferior. Urgent cardioversion, whether it's electrical or pharmacologic, is indicated in patients with atrial fibrillation and hypotension, acute MI, or acute heart failure. If the atrial fibrillation duration is less than 48 hours and cardioversion is planned, a pre-procedural anticoagulation can be considered. If the atrial fibrillation duration is not known or the atrial fibrillation lasted longer than 48 hours, anticoagulation for three weeks is recommended before an elective cardioversion. If the atrial fibrillation patient needs cardioversion sooner, this requires a TEE to exclude the presence of left atrial appendage thrombus and facilitate urgent cardioversion. After cardioversion, all patients must be on anticoagulation for at least four weeks after the procedure. Why so? because patients are at increased risk for thromboembolic events after sinus rhythm is restored. Frequent falls, especially without any history of associated bleeding, should not be a reason to withhold anticoagulation. One study estimated that an average risk elderly patient would have to fall 295 times per year for the risk of anticoagulation to outweigh the benefit. For patients who cannot tolerate anticoagulation, there are a number of procedural options that can reduce the risk of stroke. Precutaneously placed devices, like the Watchman device, occlude the left atrial appendage, which is where clots tend to form in atrial fibrillation. It is important to note that patients are at high thrombotic risk paraprocedurally and require anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy for a period of time. For patients undergoing other cardiac surgery, surgical left atrial appendage ligation during the procedure reduces the risk of stroke, but it's still recommended that patients continue oral anticoagulation. In general, in most patients with stable coronary disease, defined as at least one year from myocardial infarction or revascularization, adding aspirin to anticoagulation therapy only increases bleeding risk without decreasing thrombotic events. Most patients can be treated with anticoagulation alone. For patients with end-stage renal disease or creatinine clearance of less than 15, your only two options are apixaban and warfarin. Rate control is necessary in patients with rapid ventricular rates to improve cardiac function and reduce symptoms. In an acute setting, the goal heart rate is between 60 to 110 beats per minute. In chronic stable atrial fibrillation, the heart rate goal is less than 80 beats per minute. What are the three classes of medications used for rate control in atrial fibrillation? They are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. Beta blockers commonly used for rate control include metoprolol tartrate or succinate, cavetolol, bisoprolol, and atenolol. The choice depends on the provider preference and other comorbidities. 
For instance, if the patient is also hypertensive, then select carvedilol, which can also help with blood pressure reduction. Evidence-based beta blockers are preferred in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and this includes metoprolol-succinate, not metoprolol-tartrate, carvedilol, or bisoprolol. However, beta blockers have a negative inotropic effect and should be used with caution in patients with acute heart failure. Use with caution in patients with severe bronchospasms as well. Patients with COPD tend to tolerate beta blockers quite well, while it may be best to find alternative medication in patients with asthma or reactive airway disease. Cardio-selected beta blockers like metoprolol and bisoprolol may be best tolerated. Diltiazem is the most common calcium channel blocker used for weight control, available in short and long-acting formulations. It is contraindicated in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as it is a stronger negative inotrope. Digoxin is not first line for weight control, but is useful as adjunctive medication, especially in patients with severe or decompensated heart failure as it is a positive inotrope, whereas beta blockers and CCBs are negative inotropes. It is readily cleared and should be avoided or used very cautiously in patients with renal dysfunction as they may develop digoxin toxicity. The last line of option for rate control in atrial fibrillation is AV node ablation with pacemaker placement. This strategy is often seen in patients who are otherwise refractory to rate and rhythm control, particularly in patients with tachyarrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy. Rate versus rhythm control in atrial fibrillation is an area of rapidly changing debate. In general, there is a current movement towards broader and earlier use of rhythm control in most patients. Factors that favor rhythm control include age or younger patients, those with fewer comorbidities, and those patients with more recent onset atrial fibrillation. Since recent onset atrial fibrillation patients are more likely to successfully maintain sinus rhythm. Another factor that may favor rhythm control are patients with symptoms attributable to atrial fibrillation. Keep in mind that symptoms can be independent of heart rate. Some patients feel poorly even with rate-controlled atrial fibrillation. And sometimes the only way to know if their symptoms are related to atrial fibrillation is to see how they feel when the rhythm turns into a normal sinus rhythm. Other factors that may favor rhythm control include patients with the inability to achieve ade adequate rate control, patients with cardiac-induced cardiomyopathy, and there's also growing evidence that patients with LV dysfunction of any cause may also benefit from rhythm control. There are three broad categories of rhythm control. This includes electrical cardioversion, antiarrhythmic medications, and ablation. Four common antiarrhythmic medications for atrial fibrillation includes amiodarone, sotalol, dofetilide, and flaconide. Amiodarone is one of the most common and effective antiarrhythmics, but has a wide range of toxicities. It requires routine monitoring of pulmonary functions with PFTs, as well as liver and thyroid function. Sotalol and dofetilide both prolong the QTC interval and increase the risk of trisades, so much so that they require initiation in the hospital for continuous telemetry monitoring. Renally dosed, so watch for changes in renal function. Flecainide is well tolerated, but it is contraindicated in patients with structural heart disease or coronary artery disease. Now let's do some rapid fire concepts. Urgent cardioversion to sinus rhythm is indicated in patients with unstable atrial fibrillation. These are atrial fibrillation with hypotension, acute MI, and acute CHF. Make sure you memorize the CHASVAS2 score before your exam, and a CHASVAS2 score in men 
of 2 and 3 in women should be treated with oral anticoagulation. DOAC is preferred to warfarin for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Warfarin is the primary anticoagulation for valvular atrial fibrillation. Valvular atrial fibrillation includes patients with moderate to severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical valve prosthesis. Watchman is one of the non-pharmacological options if a patient cannot tolerate anticoagulation. In patients with CAD and is on aspirin and now develops a atrial fibrillation, it is okay to discontinue aspirin and start anticoagulation. In patients with an estimated GFR of less than 15 or end-stage renal disease, warfarin or apixaban are the only options for anticoagulation. The heart rate goal in acute atrial fibrillation is 60 to 110 beats per minute. The heart rate goal in chronic stable atrial fibrillation is less than 80 beats per minute. Rate control medications in atrial fibrillation includes beta blocker, CCB, and digoxin. Rhythm control medications in atrial fibrillation includes amiodarone, sodalol, defetilide, and flaconine. Thank you, and this ends my talk on high-yield atrial fibrillation management for USMLE and NBME internal medicine exam.